Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about homeostasis and feedback loops, how we control our homeostasis. So homeostasis is the maintenance of relatively stable conditions necessary for effective functioning and survival. Um, so it's our body's maintenance of balance. It's our body's maintenance of the normal healthy levels of all of the different functions that we are constantly um, having to regulate and keep within a very narrow range to be able to live and thrive. Um, so homeostasis ensures that the body's internal environment remains constant despite changes inside and outside the body. Um, so our environment is always changing around us. We live in this body that is experiencing the environment around us and the temperature might be getting warmer or colder. We might have access to food, we might not. Um, so we have constantly changing conditions um, that are happening inside of the body and conditions that are changing outside of the body. So we need to be able to manage our blood sugar and our blood oxygen levels and our body temperature and many, many, many different conditions in the body. We need to be able to manage and regulate those um, to make sure that we can survive because all it takes is like pH of blood to just be a little bit out of our range or um, to just have one little thing off in the body and that could be enough to cause serious disease or even death. Um, so we're constantly having to manage all of these different uh, functions and levels in the body. Each body system contributes to homeostasis in some way. Um, so every system of the body has some contribution that it makes to the homeostasis of, of the entire body, to our survival. Um, the reproductive system, of course, has functions in reproduction, which is a rare function of the body that does not determine our survival. So we might not be able to reproduce or choose not to reproduce, um, and that isn't going to cause our demise. Whereas most other functions in the body, um, if something doesn't work anymore or if it loses its homeostasis, most other things cause disease or even death. Um, so the reproductive system, even with that said, still has functions that are important for our survival and good health. So uh, the hormones that are produced as part of the reproductive system are critical to our maintaining our balance. So all of the systems in the body are working together to keep us alive. They're all working together um, so to help us maintain our health and balance and homeostasis of the many different functions in the body. Homeostasis is dynamic. So the state of the body is never completely static. Um, so like blood glucose level, just as an example, it's not completely static. It's always fluctuating up and down within a range. Uh, so it's constantly changing. Um, it changes over time. And all of these different functions that we're constantly regulating, we are regulating to keep within a very narrow range. Um, so like we're keeping blood pH in a very narrow range and blood glucose in a very narrow range. And when we get outside of those ranges of all the many things that we're regulating, when we get outside of those ranges, that's when we start to have disease, dysfunction, and even potentially death. Uh, so homeostatic mechanisms are mainly under the control of two systems. So it's under the control of our nervous system and the endocrine system. Um, so the nervous system and the endocrine system control absolutely everything the body does. Uh, the nervous system, of course, we're talking about the brain, spinal cord, and all the nerves that are coming off of the nervous system, the central nervous system. Um, and the endocrine system, that is our system of hormones. Um, so together, the two systems are controlling and bossing around everything else in the body to maintain homeostasis and to maintain all of the many functions that are necessary from all the different systems of the body to keep us not only alive, but healthy. Um, so the difference, the reason we need both systems to control is that they control us differently. Uh, the nervous system gives us fast, immediate um, instructions or corrections to different things in the body. Um, so we can have 
very localized, very immediate control. So the brain can send out signals through the nerves out to all the many um, places in the body to give signals to say, do this right now. And it will only happen in that location where that signal was sent. It will happen immediately and it will be fleeting. So the effect will only last as long as the impulses are still going from the nervous system to the thing that is being controlled. The endocrine system, it sends its signals by putting hormones, which are chemical messengers, into the blood. And then that blood is going everywhere throughout the body. So we're sending the chemical message of, from those hormones through the entire body through the blood supply. So it takes longer for those hormones to be secreted and for that blood to travel everywhere. It takes longer to be initiated. It takes longer once we don't want that signal sent anymore for those hormones to be taken up out of the blood. And the other effect is that it's body-wide instead of local. So the hormone is going out to the whole body and it's interacting with any cells that receive that particular message from that hormone. It's going to the whole body instead of the nervous system where it can act just on one very specific local place. Okay, so together the nervous and the endocrine systems are controlling everything in the body through the nervous system being immediate, fleeting, and local, and the endocrine system being slower to act but longer lasting and more body-wide. So we use those two different control mechanisms to control different functions of the body depending on whether we want them to be immediate and fleeting or long lasting and slower to change. So like things like growth and metabolism and, and things that we want to maintain relatively in a relatively stationary um, or less fluctuation um, will control with hormones and things that we want to change rapidly um, will control with nerves. So we control using feedback loops. So homeostasis is maintained um, using mostly negative feedback loops. So it's a cycle of events in which a condition in the body is continually monitored, evaluated, changed, re-monitored, re-evaluated, and so on. It just goes on and on forever like that. Um, so that's things like body temperature, blood pressure, blood glucose level, and I can go on all day listing all of the many, many, many things in the body that we are constantly controlling and monitoring so that we can stay within our homeostatic range. So a stimulus would be anything that disrupts the controlled condition. So like a stimulus could be eating sugar. That is going to disrupt blood glucose levels. And so that stimulus is going to have to, it's going to cause our negative feedback loop to work to counteract that increase in blood glucose to make sure that we maintain our homeostasis. So there's three components that make up a feedback system. First, we have the receptors. So those are sensory receptors that we have throughout the body. Um, they're detecting information and changes in the internal environment and in the external environment. Um, so they're detecting like temperature in the air around us, or they're detecting changes in blood sugar or blood oxygenation, just as examples. Okay, so they're detecting that information and they're sending it to the control center, which would be the brain. Okay, so the brain is the control center. Um, so the brain is where we set the ranges for each of these controlled conditions. So the brain is what says, okay, we want blood glucose to be between this, you know, between here and here in this range. Or we want blood pH to be between here and here. Or we need this amount of oxygen. So the, the brain has all of these levels set for all of the bazillion things that we are controlling in the body. So it, the brain is receiving all of this sensory information from the sensory receptors that are saying, here's the current state of things. So then the brain says, okay, well, um, maybe we want blood glucose to be higher or we need to lower blood pressure for our given level of activity or whatever it is. And so the brain is saying, okay, well, 
um, the, our amount of this thing is getting too high or too low and we're in risk, we're at risk or in danger of going outside of our homeostatic ranges. So then the brain is going to send output, it's going to send a plan out to the effectors of the body. So the effectors are body structures that receive the output from the brain, from the control center, and they produce a response to cause the change that the brain decided we need to have. Okay, so the effectors are always muscles or glands. Okay, so it could be skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, um, it could be endocrine glands, it could be exocrine glands, um, but the effectors are only ever muscles or glands. Those are the things in the body that are capable of responding to the commands that the brain sent down to cause a change to happen in the body. So there's going to be some kind of muscle or some kind of gland that responds and takes action to make the change based on what the brain said needs to be changed so that we can stay inside of our homeostatic range. Okay, so here's um, just kind of a diagram to show exactly what I'm describing here. So if we look on the left, we start with a stimulus. The sensor detects that stimulus. The control, that would be the brain, receives that information from the sensor and then sends commands out to the effectors so that the effectors can change the state of the environment. And then we go back around again and the sensors continue to detect whatever the stimulus is. So the sensors are constantly detecting how much oxygen is in the blood, just as one example. So the stimulus is constantly triggering the sensors, which are constantly sending that to the brain, which is constantly sending feedback or motor commands to the effectors to tell them how to control the stimulus. So it's a constant loop. Uh, so that's a negative feedback loop. Um, so let's talk about negative versus positive feedback loops. A negative feedback loop is what we just described where it reverses a change in a controlled condition. So that's where we say, okay, blood sugar is getting too high. So the brain receives that information about that stimulus and the brain will send a command down to the pancreas to tell it to secrete insulin. That's a hormone. So it's secreting the hormone insulin into the blood, which tells the cells to take up that glucose out of the blood, which the result then is that blood glucose goes down. Okay, so a negative feedback loop is where we are going through our cycle to reverse the change, meaning that the controlled condition is getting too close to the edge of our homeostatic range, and we need to reverse that and draw it back in again. Okay, so that's our negative feedback loop. So the activity of the effector produces a result that reverses the effect of the stimulus. So the muscles or glands are gonna do some kind of action that's going to reverse that controlled condition to bring it into the, back into our range so that we maintain our homeostasis. So we use these feedback loops to regulate conditions that are held fairly stable over long periods, which is pretty much everything. Okay, so almost everything in the body is regulated via negative feedback loops. It works just like the thermostat in your house. Um, like if you set your thermostat to 70 degrees, as that temperature climbs above 70 degrees, your air conditioning will kick on to bring that temperature back down. Then as it gets lower and lower, and now maybe it's dropping below 70 degrees, the air conditioner is gonna kick back off again so that the temperature can increase back to 70, which is the goal. So it'll be constantly fluctuating within a range where the target is something in the center. Okay, and then vice versa, we could describe the same kind of loop if we're using the heat in the winter, but it's the same idea. A positive feedback loop is our other control mechanism, but in this case, when we have a change in the controlled condition, the positive feedback loop kicks it over the edge. It pushes it further rather than trying to draw that controlled condition back in to maintain homeostasis. This is a rare exception. Almost everything is negative feedback loops. Positive is a rare thing. It's really childbirth and blood clotting are our two big examples of a positive feedback loop. 
Uh, so that's where we strengthen a change in a controlled condition instead of trying to reverse it. So we reinforce conditions that don't happen very often. So childbirth and blood clotting. Um, so in the case of childbirth, rather than trying to prevent childbirth and the body use negative feedback loops to draw the hormones back into balance and prevent childbirth, that's not what we want. We want childbirth to take place when the time comes. And so instead of trying to reverse it with a negative feedback loop, the body enforces or strengthens that change with a positive feedback loop. So at that point, you ramp up the oxytocin and push the body further down that path to cause um, childbirth to happen or with blood clotting. Normally, we are trying to uh, regulate that and not have blood clotting take place so that we don't have um, blockages and things. Uh, but in the case that we do have a broken blood vessel, instead of allowing blood to hemorrhage, we do want a blood clot to form there. So instead of trying to reverse that change in a controlled condition, which in that case is the amount of clotting taking place, we push it over the edge and push, strengthen that response and push it further into the blood clotting. Um, so in those cases, we need to shut off that strengthened condition by something outside the system so that it can't run away. So for childbirth, it would be the birth of the child, and then we return back to homeostasis, and those hormones are again regulated via negative feedback loops as usual. Um, or in blood clotting, the, the event would be that the blood vessel heals sufficiently that the hemorrhaging stops. So that stops and then we can draw the clotting back into normal homeostasis again. So homeostasis and disease. Uh, loss of homeostasis in any component or body system uh, is gonna cause some kind of problem. So it could be disruption of normal balance of other systems and processes, uh, could be disorders. So any abnormality of structure or function, disease, a little bit more severe, and illness characterized by a recognizable set of symptoms and signs. Um, and if the imbalance is severe enough, it could cause death. Okay, so four Ds, disruption or dysfunction, disorders, disease, and death, if uh, homeostasis is disrupted. So I mentioned a moment ago, signs and symptoms. Um, so I just wanna mention briefly the difference. So a symptom is something subjective. So it's a change in body functions, but we can't measure it. An outside observer cannot measure or in any way observe a symptom. A symptom is something that the person experiencing it has to report. Uh, versus a sign is an objective change that an outside observer can somehow observe or measure or detect without the person reporting it. So like the difference is um, nausea would be a symptom that the person would have to report. You can't visibly see nausea. Uh, you might see facial expressions or because we're humans, we are able to interpret body language and things to think that it might be nausea. But you, there's no way to measure or actually observe the feeling of nausea, that's a symptom. But if the person starts vomiting, that is a sign that clearly an outside observer can witness. So a sign is vomiting. Nausea would be a symptom that might lead to vomiting. Okay, so that is all I have for you in this lecture. Thank you for watching.